So the majority of computer systems are running gigabit over ethernet. It's really popular, it's what's out there, it's been around for a while, but so has 10 gigabit. And 10 gigabit in the standard specifically that we're using, and I pulled up the Wikipedia page because there's even more standards than I was even aware of. Uh, the one we're gonna be talking about today is SFP Plus Direct Connect Copper. And this is actually standard that's been around for 2006. Now the good news about something that's been around since 2006, there's a lot of it on eBay. There's a lot of used cards that are 10 gigabit that are, well, very affordable to build your connection like we did between our Citrix Zen server and our FreeNAS box. And we wanted, you know, 10 gigabits. Now, there's other ways to achieve high speed connections between FreeNAS, such as bonding together several network interfaces. But the 10 gigabit is a really affordable way to do it. And I like even labeled in the Wikipedia article here, it says cheap, low latency, and low power, which definitely defines it. So it's both affordable, easy, and really low latency to do this. So we're gonna show you first what the parts we bought are. This is the Twin X cabling uh, type SFP plus direct attach copper. And I'll leave all the links below to this. Uh, we can look up the Wikipedia page, but where you can get this. So we chose the uh, Chelsea NetApp dual port SFP plus 10 gig uh, connector. This card is all of $22 on Amazon, and I ordered a couple of them. It is both supported in Zen Server and FreeNAS. It's been actually, specifically when you look these up as FreeNAS based on FreeBSD, so you look up the FreeBSD support. This card's been in there a while. Someone made a comment before that this wasn't supported. You go ahead and look it up. Um, I actually bought it a little while ago, but I've been busy and haven't had a chance to install it and set things up. There's a whole series of things that had to occur before we got to this point. So we ordered a pair of these. now. It has two, which is really nice, because that means if I wanted to connect this to two separate FreeNAS boxes, I could, or have the FreeNAS box connect to something else. But we're only gonna use one of the ports for this demonstration, and kind of give you an idea of how we set it up. Now, this is the cable we bought. This is what they look like. They have little tiny connectors on them uh, that slide in, they clip in really easy, and you pull this little piece here to uh, pull the clip out. I don't have it physically in my hand because I got it plugged in and working. I didn't feel like shutting down my virtual machines just so I can show you this. Uh, but these are common, you see them between switches and things like that as well, but they will work without a switch. That was something I wasn't real clear about before, but after doing some testing, that's part of the reason we bought this, and now I'm doing the video to let people know you can just buy a pair of these, you can set them up and direct connect them between there. Now, let me show you how the direct connection is set up. I have a diagram I drew. So I have my FreeNAS box and I have my Citrix N server. There is a series of network ports on this, multiple cards, multiple cards in the Zen server. Uh, some of it goes over here to a this network with some VLANs and then this network, which is for some other the virtual machines that I want on a completely physically separate network, not just VLAN off. So that's all that, but no switch, direct cable SFP plus. The cable I showed you, the Twin X SFP plus cable is plugged directly one end into the FreeNAS and one end to the Zen server. Now, because PFSense is providing all the IP ranges and routing for everything that's going through the switch parts of this, we have to then assign IP addresses. So let me just kind of walk you through some of the setup for that. So we go over here to the FreeNAS box. And in case you're wondering, because this will come up, uh, this is an Intel i5 processor, the uh, i5-4570 at 3.2 gigahertz with 16 gigs of RAM. And we're gonna talk about the performance you get with this and where some of the bottlenecks still are. Now the network setup, interfaces. Right here is the interface, uh, that's the 10 gigabit one, active. And what we had to do was sign it a static IP address, which was 192.168.10.10. Then .10. figure 10 gigabit, put it in the 10 network. Here's the two other networks I mentioned that are standard ones in there. Now there's no gateway on this. One other thing we did when you're having two direct connections so you can get the most speed, lowest latency, is enable the jumbo frames. Uh, I tried a couple different settings, the default 1500, 4500, and then 9000. And the 9000 works quite well for giving me the least amount of latency. What a jumbo frame is allowing per each frame more data within it essentially. I'm not gonna get into all the details on that, but I, when you're tuning these, you have to have everything matching on both ends. So we both put the MTU 9000 setting on this one, and then we put this on the Zen server. So this one's assigned 10.10. .10. It's going to the iSCSI is where it's bonded, and it's 
running on a RAID Z2, which is also going to come up because people are going to ask about performance. So let's switch over to look at how it's done in the Zen server. So here's the Zen server. Here's the networks. Oops, I'm sorry, networking. And it's referred to as a storage. Now you notice the lack of a gateway. So this is 192.168.10.15. I know it's a little small. I don't really have an easy way to zoom that. But this is .10.15. So it's directly connected. Now I made the net mask uh, slash 24 in case I ever wanted to add more to it. I could have narrowed it down to just two IPs. It's not overly relevant because there's nothing else on that network. Matter of fact, because they're directly attached with no switch in between, like I showed you in the diagram, it is a direct absolute connection to it. So it doesn't really matter what other IPs are in there. But not having a gateway also means nothing tries to route over that network. So it's by itself and nothing's ever gonna go there other than things calling for that. And the only thing tied to that is the storage. So when you're setting up your storage repositories, and we'll jump over to one of them here, we have this free NAS one here, storage. And you can see that the iSCSI LUN is that there. So when you're adding the storage, just like I showed you in the other video, you put in the iSCSI, but you just put in the IP address of it routed over that. Now back to how that goes in here. Services. And under portals, you say which IP addresses it's bind to. I have it binded to the 10.10 .10 and the 2.7. Uh, the 2.7 is so I can actually do some iSCSI targets over standard gigabit while I was doing some testing. I'm not really using it at the moment, but then you bind it to here 10.10. .10. Uh, as I talked about in my other video for setting up Citrix Zen server with an iSCSI backend with FreeNAS is you need to identify and implicitly list in the portals which IPs it's gonna bind to. It doesn't just automatically, like some of the other services in FreeNAS, bind to all of them at once. So when you're going through the iSCSI setup, you go to and set up which IPs it's gonna be attached to. So we attach it to that one. And then when we set up the Citrix Send server, we've attached it to that same IP address, which automatically, because that's the only thing that can route over that network, automatically goes across the gigabit because it's a non-routed and it realizes that's where it's gonna go. And the .10 network doesn't exist anywhere else, so it can't try to guess the wrong things. All right. Now this is where we're going to talk a little bit about the performance and the reason I mentioned that it's RAID Z2. This is an amazing guide someone did. It's uh, ZFS RAID performance, capacity, and integrity, comparing space speed uh, and safety per RAID type. And they basically took the same drives and benchmarked them in amazing different configurations. So they took 24 drives and gave you each read-write performance. So I have four drives, RAID Z2, and that's where my performance level is. And I bring this up because 10 gigabit is faster than the drives themselves. Now, there are ways, if you're really in this for performance, getting some drives and setting them up, and this configuration guide uh, will give you the most effective way to set these up um, on there for the most speed. So that's why I'll leave a link to here. So if you're trying to design it and you have a performance concern, this will show you the fastest performance you can do uh, with the right amount of drives and how you can get to that. So that being said, this is with our FreeNAS box. Let me show you what the benchmarks look like and the load on FreeNAS. That's why I talked about the specs a lot here. So let's jump over to here. And this is the disk performance we're getting. It's actually pretty impressive. So this is the Passmark uh, software. I'm running Windows in here. And Windows runs quite well. So actually, uh, I haven't really had any problems with it. It's Windows 10, so it's you know pretty grindy for hard drives as far as I'm concerned. Windows 10 doesn't feel the most efficient to me. But uh, launching applications, not really a big deal. This actually pauses on the preferences for some of the plugins. Um, but it seems to launch reasonably fast. I purposely, purposely opened this, something completely uncached, because I've been running the disk mark utilities quite a few times, so I could uh, get that and give us a second. Yeah, pauses on some of the plugins I have, and then it opens up. So, and this is over an RDP connection. So you can see that I'm reasonable uh, disk performance I'm getting out of this across the time gigabit over to there. Because once you raid them together, the drives are actually a little faster and this scores, let me pull up the pass mark scores and bring them over to the screen here. I know they're a little small, let me zoom in here. So this is at uh, 4,445 is the disk mark using the uh, pass mark test. 
and we'll zoom in here. And that actually puts me up here with some of the single SSD performance. So not horrible. Uh, pretty reasonable, and of course, that's enough for me. I know you can get even better disk performance if I were to put this, for example, on an SSD array. These are all spinning 7200 RPM drives in my free NAS box. They're the Hitachi series ones. The I'll find the model and leave it in the link in the description. But yeah, they're not anything super high performance. These are not like your 15,000 K drives or anything like that, or they're not SSDs. So I'm actually getting some pretty reasonable performance using the Gigabit using a RAID Z2. And the machines, the virtual machines running on there are completely very usable and without really any issues here. So let's talk about though, what this looks like when we run this. So let's go back to reporting. Here's where I ran the disk tests on here. And you can see that we almost hit 60% CPU usage on running them, almost 60% on an i5. So pretty much, not much. Now this is also everything else running on here at the same time. I still have all my uh, primary virtual machines running on here. I still have my NVRs running on this, the, well, using the drive for it, which is another virtual machine that's tied over to here. And it's working quite well. It barely taxes the system. And that's at full disk read, doing something real intensive just for the purpose of benchmarking and testing. And you can see like, here's the iSCSI tests where we ran them here. You can see where it peaks out and uh, seeing like 600 uh, megs and not, not bad performance. So it's definitely uh, taxing it and it works quite well. And system processes, well, let me look at network performance. You can see where the network spikes came through because it's jumping across that network, the gigabit network. So there's our little spikes for some of the tests we did. Doesn't really have much of an effect on the memory on this. Uh, we're seeing just a little bit of change in here. Most of the memory in FreeNAS in the system gets put over to ARC or you know some of the caching for FreeNAS. And there's all the disk IO and the spikes you've seen for the read-write test that we're doing with that. So it's really not that hard on the system. But let's get back to some of the design considerations when you're using iSCSI and FreeNAS. Now this is part of the FreeNAS 11 documentation. It says, for performance reasons to avoid excessive fragmentation, keep the use space below pool below 50% when using iSCSI. The capacity of an existing extent can be increased by growing your lens. And this is just part of the documentation. This is a little bit of a design problem, so to speak, with the way ZFS works. Now, this is where those are located. This is the Zen storage. And because the way iSCSI works, on top of ZFS. It's set up as just an individual file. That file is one contiguous file as far as the system is concerned, as in Citrix. But ZFS is a copy on write file system. So every time a write is committed, an entirely new copy is moved and it kind of shifts it over. There's some technical details you can read about exactly how that works, but you can see immediately where there might be a problem with that, where you don't have enough storage to create another copy. Well, then it won't do that. And then you start running into fragmentation problems because it's got to write parts of it different into the file system. So you can run into overall slower performance because there's not enough space to for ZFS to do its magic in the copy on write. But the thing that's interesting to me about this is Zen doesn't support thin provisioning, but that means you can't thinly provision or uh, compress the drives and only allocate what's needed. So if you have a, a one terabyte allocation, it wants to allocate one terabyte, even though you may only be using inside the virtual machine physically, like you know 10 gigs of storage. So this is where ZFS works some magic. The files are bigger as far as they're reported to in Zen. Zen thinks of this as a three terabyte uh, load, and we now have two of them on here. Because ZFS works with compression, it only is using 198 gigs, or because these drives, I have 1.7 terabytes here, it's only using at a 4% usage right here. So it's not using a whole lot of the 1.7 terabyte available space. I'm oh, sorry, not 1.7, uh, 4.3 terabyte space. So we have 4.3 terabytes, but on, on the Zen storage, we only have this small amount used. And let's look inside of how Zen looks at this. This is where it gets kind of cool. So you've seen a disk performance and uh, yeah, we'll be disconnected. And when we look at the storage, I moved over to the Zen Orchestra because it gives me a better view of the storage. We look at the storage, we have a 
two point with three terabyte, two point four seven terabyte today, five hundred forty six gigs used. But this is only one piece of it. That Windows isn't even on this one. This is just some of the other drives I have, and as you can see, it's showing based on the entire extent of the drive. So let's go to the other storage pools, and this is a second one I have called FreeNAS Lab, and it's a one terabyte with another two hundred eighty five gig use. So I have. 700 to 285 plus the 546, that's 831 gigs used. Yet FreeNAS only sees 198 gig use. So this is where the whole magic happens with FreeNAS compression ZFS. If you're not then provisioning, you're just filling the drive with zeros. So FreeNAS goes, no problem. I see a bunch of zeros. That's really easily compressed and then brings it all down. So both of these extents for the two I have, and like I said, the one V, you can notice I have one called Lab and one called just FreeNAS. So Lab is where I'm doing some of my testing with a bunch of other random virtual machines. But you can see that there's so much data used according to Zen, but then FreeNAS goes, I got this and compresses all of it. So it's actually not using as much. So this makes storage that much trickier, so to speak, and thinking about it, because it's not just allocation, because this is going to work some magic and compress a lot of it. You actually don't go, oh no, I'm only going to be able to create a storage extent that's this small. You're going to be able to create something bigger, not bigger than the entire drive, but you're going to use it more efficiently because FreeNAS will take care of the compression that and still not compromise performance. So yes, the 50% rule does apply. You do not want it to exceed that, but do that knowledge based on what you see in FreeNAS, not what you see, so to speak, in Zen Orchestra or in Zen Server in general, uh, when you're looking at the size of the drives. And this is, like I said, important when, when you're looking at the design of it going, okay, I do have enough room to build out these virtual machines with larger hard drives, even though they're empty and not thin provisioned, you still have the space to do it. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about as far as that. So we, first we can build the 10 gigabit really cheap. We can use it across iSCSI. And before people start slamming me and go, you can't use it on FreeNAS because of the 50% problem and it wastes a bunch of storage. Yes, you can. And FreeNAS will take care of that, even though it's not thin provisioned. So I just wanted to share that with you. This is how we're, we have things set up on our virtual machines with our Citrix Zen server. This is more or less kind of production, kind of lab. It's a little bit of both for me for all the stuff I do, um, but it's working wonderfully. And also I'll show you real quick here. This is uh, the performance reports of what most of the stuff looks like for us for, let's go to a one day view. So it's actually way overkill for our machine. So uh, we barely use any CPU on this unless I'm doing testing. This is my testing I was doing this morning. You can see that it's very, very low usage. So uh, it's nice because when I do want to uh, do some testing, these things open up really fast. Matter of fact, even creating snapshots and uh, jumping around for virtual servers it's nice how fast this works. And this is really affordable. I mean, you look at these parts on Amazon and you know, uh, thirty under $30 for a 10 gigabit card along with the Twin X cable being $17. So uh, basically for under $100, you can get 10 gigabit connectivity between two adjacent servers, or you could even do this for your own computer. And I've, I've seen people uh, do this. You want really high speed uh, and the awesomeness of FreeNAS, you can put this in your computer plug it in directly and have your FreeNAS box next to your computer and enjoy the RAID Z3 even on a Windows box shared and it'll work over that as well. So that's about it I have for this. I The only thing I did realize and I kind of found a problem and I, I got to work on this and make it a, a bug report. I found out that if you both use this for iSCSI and NFS at the same time on the same network, and you try to do fully saturated read writes from both, that FreeNAS goes no and just turns off the network interface. I've tried this on a couple different network interfaces, both gigabit and a 10 gigabit, and then the problem occurred on both. I'm trying to create a, a test scenario because uh, it was bad when I did it because I was trying to back up virtual machines across both at the same time and created a problem. So I got to create a, a little template for this and talk to the FreeNAS people to say, um, I can make this problem repeat and it's kind of interesting. So uh, if you're doing it for iSCSI, you probably want to dedicate it for iSCSI if you decide to go with NFS, dedicated to NFS. And I'd mentioned before, just so you're wondering, iSCSI with Zen works wonderful. 
with FreeNAS, FreeNAS does not work wonderful with Zen over NFS. There's apparently some syncing issues and the performance isn't quite there. Uh, much better performance over iSCSI in case that question comes up. All right, once again, hopefully this was helpful and taught you a little bit about how 10 gigabit works and how Zen can perform on it and how you can put together a 10 gigabit network for under $100 uh, for the upgrade and pop these cards in. Uh, oh, in case you're wondering, this is only an 8X uh, slot, so they're not really, it, most computers have this. Like I said, this card is old as well. It's been around for, it's been around for a little while and you may even find it cheaper somewhere else. I'll just throw in the Amazon links because they're in stock right now. Uh, if not, you can use the part numbers to, you know, find one for yourself. All right. If you like to count here, like and subscribe. And if you have more questions about 10 gigabit or if you, th you think I didn't cover something, so I need to do a follow-up video, let me know.